So today we're going to talk about collectability of Apple iBook laptops. And you know, the irony is, uh, if you go back years ago when I used to run my computer business, um, it was not uncommon for me to have hundreds of Apple iBooks uh, laying around my workshop. Um, now that was a long time ago and I haven't worked on iBooks in, in forever it seems like. And uh, this particular one is the only one I've even uh, held on to. And uh, it's an iBook G4 and uh, the logic board has a problem where basically no Wi-Fi card will ever work in it again. And uh, so I didn't sell it, I just decided to keep it uh, just so I'd have an iBook to play with every now and then. But now here's the irony. Um, I'm the iBook guy and I've been out on surfing eBay trying to buy you know, used iBooks in order to uh, you know, put some in my museum uh, because I'm a collector. And uh, so anyway, um, you know, many of my viewers have asked me, are iBooks collectible? I think they are and that's uh, what we're here to talk about. Now I did want to point out, this is June of 2015, so if you're watching this video uh, years from now, then you might keep in mind that the prices and stuff, uh, collectability values may have changed some from what I'm about to show you. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to tell you is that if you had an old um, IBM or Dell or Compaq or Hewlett Packard or something like that laying around, those computers are probably never going to come collectible. Now, I can't guarantee it, but they, they probably won't because they're just too generic and they don't really hold any historical or pop culture significance. Now, um, everything Apple makes, on the other hand, will probably become collectible at some point be because of how unique and uh, um, how iconic their products are. And just to give you an example of that, let me show you a series of movie clips uh, containing uh, iBook clamshells. It can be seen in the beginning of The Princess Diaries, although it isn't being used by a major character. In Legally Blonde, Reese Witherspoon's character can actually be seen purchasing one and then using it in class. Seth Rogen uses one in Zack and Mary Make a Porno. The main character uses one in Under the Tuscan Sun. Lily's character in The Glass House uses one for her homework. And you can also find the G3 and G4 models as well in several movies, and here's some clips from some of those. One can be seen in Spy Kids too, but you have to look pretty closely. You can clearly see this one in John Tucker Must Die. Ben Stiller uses this one in Meet the Fockers. Anne Hathaway uses one in the movie One Day. And they're also used in the TV series iCarly, only that are slightly modified as pair books. Now, it should be important to note how the life cycle of collectible computers go. When they're brand new, they start out very expensive, and then as they become obsolete, they eventually become worthless. In fact, they can often wind up costing more to ship than they're even worth. At this point, most old computers will go into the trash or end up being recycled in one form or another but some computers will become collectible, at which point their value will increase and sometimes far beyond the original value. Okay, so where are the iBooks in this stage of the game? Now, honestly, I'm gonna say the clamshells are probably right about here. It is not uncommon to see them selling for several hundred dollars on eBay if they're in excellent shape. The tangerine and key lime versions are the most expensive for some reason, possibly because there were fewer of those colors made. I don't know. So if you're not too picky about color, you can still pick up an iBook clamshell G3 uh, fairly cheaply. I bought this one here for about you know, $50, but believe it or not, this is actually, uh, I didn't buy it as one machine, this is actually two separate purchases. I bought one for $25 with a broken screen and touchpad, and then I bought another one for $25 that had just about everything else broken, and I used the best parts from each and made a nice indigo clamshell. So if you're willing to put a little work into it, uh, you can still get one pretty cheaply. One thing that I really missed about the iBook clamshells is how nice they are to type on, especially when I'm sitting here in my recliner. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something about the ergonomics of it. There's just nothing as comfortable to type on. They may not be good for much of any modern applications, but for using text editor, they work great. In fact, I wrote the script to this very video on my clamshell. And on a somewhat related note, when I took this, uh, the screen out of this clamshell, you know, I noticed that there is this foil covering up the logo on the back. I decided to peel it off and noticed that it appears the aluminum shield was actually cut perfectly to the shape of the Apple logo. Everyone knows that the next generation of iBook did in fact have a light up Apple symbol. It seems as if they had been planning to do the light up logo on even the clamshell and for some reason uh, they changed their mind. 
Now, the logo is very dark colored, so the light doesn't come through nearly as brightly as on the new ones, but you can certainly see it. Alright, so here's a question. Where do the Snow G3 and G4 iBooks fall on my little diagram here? Well, they're pretty much right here at rock bottom. Okay, so you can buy a fully working Snow G3 laptop for like less than $50. In fact, this may surprise you, this unit right here. I bought this on eBay just last week and I paid $20 for it plus shipping. So it ended up working out about, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks total and everything works on it. Even the battery works on it, which I was blown away by. The only thing actually that didn't work was the right speaker. And uh, I still had a lot of parts left over from uh, back when I used to work on iBooks. So I had a speaker, I replaced it, you know, no big deal. It wouldn't have been an expensive part anyway. Um, and uh, the thing's in darn good condition. And so, uh, you know, I've also noticed there's really no price difference between the 6, 7, 8, or 900 megahertz models. This is the 900 megahertz. And there also um, doesn't seem to be any difference in the, um, uh, the screen size, whether it's the 12 inch or the 14 inch. And I think the reason for that is because nobody that's buying these units today is actually planning on actually, you know, using them for any kind of work or anything like that. Uh, so I think the only people who are buying them are probably collectors at this point. So yeah, if you're planning to buy an iBook clamshell or, or Snow G3 or even a G4 for that matter for your collection, now is the time. Uh, they have reached rock bottom and I don't think there's anywhere for the price to go other than up. So yeah, I think these clamshells, uh, particularly uh, like the key lime and the, and the tangerine possibly will be worth many, many hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands, uh, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. And um, I even think these, these will probably never be quite as collectible, uh, but they're definitely going to go up in value. I'm, I would not be surprised 10 or 20 years from now if these aren't worth several hundred dollars. So incidentally, I wanted to show you my uh, latest item to add to my museum. I just picked this up. It's a Tandy Model 200 laptop computer, probably the first, very first ever computer with a flip up screen. Uh, it's a little bit dirty. I need to clean it up and uh, do some, uh, maybe some uh, peroxide treatment to it to brighten it up a bit, but uh, it actually works. And uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to tell you though is um, if you're going to collect computers, uh, you need to make sure even, even if they're iBooks, especially the white ones, uh, you need to store them in an environment that is cool and dry. Um, you don't uh, want to expose them to any heat or any uh, UV light. So, uh, you know, in a closet inside the house is probably a good place to store them. And you may laugh, but let me tell you a little story. It may come as a surprise to you that I actually used to own a fully functional Apple Lisa. And I bought it for $100 at a sidewalk sale back in the middle 1990s sometime. And I had it for a few years. The thing was a monster boat anchor and I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, so I took it back out to the sidewalk sale um, in Dallas and tried to sell that thing uh, a few years later and nobody would take it. And um, you know, I was trying to get like 50 bucks for it. Nobody would take it. And at the very end, before I was packing up ready to go, somebody offered me $5 for that Apple Lisa. And I let them have it because I didn't want to take it back home. And if I still had that thing today, it would be worth at least $1,000, maybe, maybe even close to $2,000, uh, as good a shape as it was in. And uh, it may also surprise you to know that I had a Commodore PET. And it was actually broken, but it could have been fixed without too, mu too much difficulty. And again, nobody would pay me anything for that. And I threw it in a trash dumpster, of all things. Yeah, I know, it should have gone to an e-waste recycling, but I didn't know about those back then. Again, because this was in the 1990s. If I still had that Commodore PET today, it'd probably be worth six or $700. And it's just gonna keep going up too, so, you know. Things uh, that may not necessarily seem like they have any value today will have value if they are collectible. Okay, so that concludes this episode for the most part. Uh, just to give you a little bit of glimpse of what's coming up. Um, I got a 3D printer and I've been kind of learning how to use it and it's actually pretty darn difficult, but I'm gonna build some interesting things for you. And I've even got a couple of inventions I'm gonna show you here that, uh, that are uh, stuff I dreamed up. We'll see how that goes over. Um, also, I'm gonna be rebuilding a battery for an old iBook uh, to show you how to put new cells in them uh, since they're getting pretty hard to find good batteries these days. And uh, I've got several other things coming up, but uh, these episodes do take a while to complete. And unlike some people, I don't produce a video until I got something really interesting to show you. I don't like just producing junk just to, you know, just to fill up space. So uh, anyway, uh, be sure to like my video. That uh, helps YouTube know that I'm doing a good job. And I'll see you next time.